I'm Martin Goff. I'm a children's orthopaedic surgeon working in the Evelina London Children's Hospital, part of Guy St. Thomas NHS Foundation Trust in London. I've got a particular interest in the orthopaedic management of children with cerebral palsy. And Adam? Yeah, oh, thank you. I, I wonder when that was coming. Uh, I am Adam Shortland. I'm a clinical scientist at uh, the Evelina Children's Hospital, um, based on a, in a very beautiful site on the banks of the River Thames. And uh, I assess children with uh, cerebral palsy in a gate lab. Um, so, and uh, Martin and I have been working together for, well, probably a bit too long, but 23 years, I reckon. Well now. Um, Some years ago, we were invited to write a book about musculoskeletal growth and development in children with cerebral palsy. So, we were very happy to take it on, but as we took it on, we found that it was a lot more interesting than it looked. So the project <laughs> broadened out, took more time than we expected, and we're very grateful for the, for the patience of the team at McKee Press. The book as it stands has six chapters with a short preface and a short conclusion. Adam? Yeah, well, so yeah, those, those chapters, they, 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 they break down the... Like Martin said, it's a it's a bigger book than we intended to to date, and it incorporates um, aspects of philosophy, how we construct a model. That's certainly uh, the first chapter, how we construct a clinical model from 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 what's lying around, actually, from from what we understand of our of our patients. Um, and the, and and the first chapter really um, is about the deficits in that model, isn't it? Yeah. In, in in the way we develop it. Uh, and the way we apply it, actually, to some extent. Um, this, the second chapter, um, well, that's a kind of slightly more prosaic thing, but it's still interesting in a sense that we're, we're, we're examining the vehicle of the randomized control trial uh, as the best method for uh, improving the science, if you like, improving the medical science. Is it the best method for doing that? So chapter three and four, in a sense, run together. So. These chapters look at the musculoskeletal system as a system, in other words, as a process rather more than a structure. I mean, one easy way of thinking of that is that a muscle on its own, without a nerve to innervate it, and a bone that it can move is, is meaningless. And equally, a musculoskeletal system without some functional goal is relatively meaningless. So the book looks at how we need to consider the musculoskeletal system in this manner, and then looks at how interaction can help us to consider things that are otherwise more difficult or more abstract. For instance, we can see movement as the outcome of interactions between the components of the system, and we can see function as interaction between the child, their musculoskeletal system, and the environment. So it essentially allows us to move from molecules to the environment and link things up in between. And then along with that, if we then think about system development, we can look at the child with cerebral palsy as having not so much simply altered muscle growth, but an altered trajectory of muscle development. And that in turn feeds back to look at how we, how we understand what's going on, how we intervene, and in particular, a move away from a normative focus the idea that we'll make these children walk like children who don't have cerebral palsy, and instead an acceptance that these have an altered development and that constrains what you can work with. The next chapter is really, again, about evidence, but really applied to cerebral palsy, not so much the construct of uh, the RCT as much as how do we make a claim for, a, for an intervention? How do we incorporate the views of uh, the patients and their parents in understanding how efficacious an intervention has been. Um, so that's that's a really a, a, a look at the failure again in our science of understanding what represents benefit and also of the mechanisms of the pathological mechanisms present. So it's an attempt to say, well, we need to incorporate sort of basic science with an understanding of the patient's own views and needs as as explained by them, with the best possible uh, biological, biochemical, all those sorts of chemicals evidence <laughs> that's present. So 
so that's interesting. It's very critical of the present state of cerebral palsy research. So that should be an interesting read for everybody. The last chapter then, chapter six, we, we start by looking at uncertainty and by explaining that uncertainty is part of clinical practice. And in a sense, we should accept it. And it gives us a way to accept this and a way to look at clinical practice by moving towards a focus on the child. We talk about some of the work of the French philosophers, which sounds a little bit out off the beaten track until you read it, in which case it's some have talked about a child's lived in body, which is the body the child experiences the world through, and a child's objective body, which is the body that we measure, we describe, we quantify. And we intervene on their objective body, but we may not be influencing their lived in body. So a shift towards is what we're doing really improving their child's experience of the world? Or are we just improving the world's experience of the child by altering them to fit our the norms. normative yeah, goal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think thanks to McKeith Press. Bernard yes. Dan for inviting us and being courageous enough to let us write it. And enormous thanks to our families who sat through many weekends wondering, were we ever going to come out of our rooms? Um, okay, I think that's probably about it. Yeah. Don't you think so, Martin? I think we've covered most so. things. Yeah. Okay, bye then. All right, bye now. <laughs>